This is Dan Schneider on this Dan Schneider video into a third interview that I'm doing on art and religion. Deborah Haynes is my guest and we'll be talking about her opinions on the subject. Deborah Haynes is my guest. We will be talking about art and its intersection with religion. As I like to usually do, I want to give my guests a few minutes to talk about who they are and their relationship to the subject. So welcome, Deborah. If I could ask you to give a couple of minutes of background about who you are, uh, what type of art has interested you, and any relevant ideas you have towards the subject. Well, goodness, thank you for the invitation to have this conversation, Dan. <laughs> How to answer this briefly, your question briefly, is a little bit of a conundrum, but I would say that from my 20s, well, even from my teens, when I took my first art class, I was uh, fascinated by questions about spirituality and art making and the purposes of art, the power of art, art of all kinds, painting, drawing, you know, you name it, installations, public sculpture, what I saw around me when I grew up in Seattle. Um, and so in my early academic experiences, I was mainly involved with practice of art in ceramics, painting, drawing, such, uh, just a stand, kind of a standard undergraduate and graduate education in, in the arts. I have an MFA and a BFA in ceramics. And I worked for a number of years, I, and my, my art took many detours. Uh, I, I made performances, I did installations. Um, I was once in an exhibition at the Smithsonian in DC. Uh, but I had a growing curiosity about the history of the relationship of, um, let's call it spiritual longing or religious aspiration and art making. And so I ended up at Harvard Divinity School first and Harvard University for a, a, an intensive seven year period of study. And, um, and I wrote a dissertation about, um, about the questions about the relevance of making art and religious aspiration. And I've, I've used that word a couple of times already. It's an important one for me, but uh, religious sensibility. So religion, of course, is a vast world. And, and I would also say that as a professor, subsequent to my, uh, my advanced degrees, I taught classes in art and religion, um, but I didn't try to make them you know, global. I, I actually would choose some cultural context in which to talk about and teach students about art and religion. For instance, Russian icons and Tibetan tankas and Navajo sand paintings and the rituals around those. And I had little forays into things like Islamic manuscripts and, um, and Haida totem poles and such. But, um, but mainly I had uh, small groups of students for those kinds of classes. And then I also um, taught very large 400 student classes in um, what we, we called post-Renaissance art, obviously a Western classification. Uh, but I always started with Africa uh, because Africa's the seat of so much early, some of the earliest human evidence, evidence of human creation comes from Africa, from rock paintings and um, a small stone, carved stone that was found in South Africa. Anyway, sorry, I think I didn't turn off the clicking on my phone. Um, so, and then finally, I guess I'd say that, I, as you know, I published seven books, numbers of articles, few, 50 articles or more. I was an art reviewer before I ever began my more academic life at Harvard, but um, I published both academic, you could call them treatises about the relationships of art creativity, artistic creativity, and religious aspiration. 
But my last book, Beginning Again, was really an attempt to to speak directly to artists and, and to talk more about my own process with this whole set of questions that I spent my adult life working on. So, so oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, no that's my introduction. Okay. Um, I know one of the reasons I wanted to do this was because uh, eventually I'd like to get uh, someone who has uh, more of a... Uh, a grounding in the, the nexus of art and religion because I, I've interviewed a number of actors over the years and there's three of them in the last couple of years that I interviewed that I spent almost as much time talking with about their religious beliefs uh, as mm. I did uh, their art and uh, so I, I, I want to eventually maybe get someone uh, together with these three actors to talk about how how that plays out in, in their different because they're, they're, all three of them are actors but also do other arts too but uh, one of the things that comes to mind when I speak with people about this who are artsy or in the arts is they always make a distinction between spiritual uh, beliefs and religion. Religion being sort of the, the political side of, of, of belief in something where spiritualism people think is more natural. Oftentimes I'll get people who are agnostic or atheistic, which I am, I'm not a... I, I, you know, I, I don't just it just isn't something that's part of my uh, my being. But a lot of them will uh, downgrade uh, Judaism or Christianity or Islam or Buddhism or whatnot. But yet they'll have their own sort of New Age spiritual beliefs. When you think of art and the intersection of religion, aside from the overt religious iconography of people like uh, you know uh, uh, Da Vinci or or, or Michelangelo or the Russian icons that you mentioned. Uh, do you do you look at that more from the spiritual or from the religious side? And is there really a difference? That's a really good question. I um, I'm less interested in institutional religion, but for instance, when I taught students about Russian icons, they need to understand a bit about orthodox orthodoxy. And because, for instance, the most famous icons, and we know this from Kazimir Malievich in the 20th century, were placed in the east. I'm pointing right now. Well, actually, I'm not. I'm, I'm pointing in the east corner. Um, icons were always placed there in a household, in a, in a church. They might be all over, but the really important ones were in the east corner. Um, and now, you know, that's, that's a specific religious decision but somewhere along the line historically i don't know exactly where it came from but in in russia in the in the whole evolution from novgorod all the way to, to you know from the ninth century or the sixth century or whatever all the way forward but spiritual aspirations to me are more personal and private and um yeah i i there's a distinction there um let me just pick up on that because because I've always said that art is communication at its highest level. So you can have spiritual beliefs, but it would seem to me that they're going to stay self-contained unless there's some art for the individual to express themselves to get it out. Not that all art is religious, all art isn't politics, yeah. all art isn't this, that, or the other thing. But it's for me, I've always looked at art as more of a verb than a noun. So you may have belief system A, other artists has B, C, up down to X or Y, Z, and uh, but the art is how they put it forth. Whether it's in photography, whether it's in cinematography, whether it's in uh, poetry, whether it's in ballet, whether it's in whatever it might be. Um, do you do you find any uh, truck with that idea that the spirituality is something that the art helps to express? Sure. How could it not be so? Not, not all art does. Somebody might look at something I'm working on and say, how does that, what does that have to do with any, I, uh, I, I'm not sure how, how, except to say I agree with you. Okay. I'm not sure what else to say about that. Well, because a lot of times people talk about the aesthetics of art um, too. Oh uh, yeah. Uh, um, you know, uh, famously 15 or was it 20 years ago, Mel Gibson did the, that what a lot of people call a torture porn film about uh, Jesus Christ's crucifixion. And a lot mm -hmm. of people were arguing, 
back then that is this really art was this is this something that's just some obsessive need of this filmmaker uh, Gibson um, and so I'm, I'm just wondering um, uh, you know can you know art I think can be ugly there's no aesthetic uh, reason it ha that has to be celebrating beauty just like it doesn't have to be political or religious um, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm just wondering because a lot of times when you look at uh, uh, religious uh, symbolism within paintings if you want to go back several hundred years or even in something like Sir Gawain and the Green Knight there's a lot of uh, earth uh, Mother Earth Christian symbolism the the beheading the the, the sexuality within that um, I, I'm just throwing these things out because a lot of times people will make these sort of blanket statements pro or con one position or another whereas to me like I said if you take the more utilitarian view that art is how something is expressed rather than what is being expressed it seems to me that's that's a, a more fertile ground for a, a nexus yeah and that's the verb yes uh, yeah the verbing that's the activity the making yeah well having worked with a lot of young artists searching to um, both develop their paths and articulate what they're doing because of course in the Academy <clears throat> which is where I've spent my good part of my adult life, you have to be able to articulate what it is you're doing and write about it and explain. And um, of course, some people are more uh, capable of that than others. But um, yeah, it, it is a art, may, it, it's a verb making art and it's, got as many shapes and forms. I mean, there's media, of course, which is highly diverse. Um, I haven't studied film, but I love film. It's, um, and, but I've done a lot of other, me I've worked with a lot of other media, in, in, including stone carving. Mainly, I say stone carving, I carve words in marble because I am a word person. Uh -huh. um, and language is just so important to me. But, um, yeah, yeah. And I don't work, actually, I don't work with particular religious iconography, although as you can see behind me, I have uh, one an example of a Bhutanese classic Wheel of Existence Tonka, Buddhist Tonka, um, that I, I've taught this, uh, this image. Well, the, there are hundreds, if not thousands of these around the world. Um, and I've taught them, I haven't taught this particular Tonka, but I've certainly studied it in depth myself. Um, anyway, kind of veering off here and there, but it's, yeah. I don't, I don't hold tight boundaries, but I also don't, um, you know, trying to, I don't try to define, um, yeah. Well, let me pick up with the idea of, of the verb of art because I think one of the things that I find annoying about art is when art is reduced to simply an act of self-expression because if it's only an act of self-expression, uh, then it's not an act of communication uh, because you know if I'm writing a poem about my poodle when I was seven and it turns out to have imagery from uh, Operation Barbarossa or something, if there's something wrong uh, that's gone on between what I put out or what thought I was putting out and what's being received. And I bring this up because uh, I, I, I skimmed through some of the online uh, sections of some of your books and there's a quote in the book that you mentioned beginning again in 2018 where you say, uh, it doesn't matter what you read, it only matters that you make space and have to encounter, uh, encounter the world through others' eyes and voices. Well, I think that's important, but it also matters how that's done, because if it's done poorly, you know, you know, if I take off these eyeglasses, I, I'm in a blur, you know? So to what degree do you think that uh, religion, well, that art suffers or not between the qualitative uh, way that it's presented? And if you're presenting something through the art, through that, uh, through through the, the the tool of art as a verb, uh, you might have the greatest point of view religiously, philosophically, but it's going to come out as gobbledygook on the other end. Yeah, it's art and audience. I mean, it's the creation. 
sometimes mm -hmm. one makes art artists do this all the time it's a kind of self as you said it's a self-involved self maybe not even self-exploration but uh but just self indulgence self-expression and and um but when one wants to communicate and self-exploration i mean i was thinking as you were speaking a moment ago i was thinking um some years ago a, a couple of years ago I uh, destroyed about 50 years of journals that I had oh been keeping, except for some drawings, uh -huh. because I always, I, I didn't draw in my journals a lot, but I did considerable amount of drawing, um, and I wanted to keep some of those, and, and they're, some of them are raw, they're just angst, you know, mm -hmm. 1970, 1975, 1985 just expressions. Now those, while they were, I mean, I'm thinking of some particular, I don't have them handy right here, but um, they were expressions of my own um, suffering, actually. And I think they could be important for other people as well, mm -hmm. but, I, but they aren't anything I've ever shown in the public sphere. Well, was um, it because they were too mawkish, too juvenile, too sentimental? Uh, maybe yeah too personal okay too personal I mean who wants to show the rage or the but if as a as somebody who has made images for a long long time I have experienced a kind of a full range of the rage the sorrow the the joy of human existence mm -hmm. I mean that so they're the creating um, consciousness in, and body that makes this, um, you know, may or may not be fit for public consumption. It, it may have some other usefulness. Why did I pull those some particular drawings out of my journals after? That was an that's an interesting thing to do, but I'm not the only one who's ever done that. I learned I was um, taking a workshop with. Um, Natalie Goldberg once. She's written a lot about yeah, journal and, and writing, writing down the bones and started with that. But somebody asked her in that workshop, um, what do you do with all your journals? She said, I destroy them. Especially the I especially I recommend you destroy the first 15 years. Just don't even bother. But but what I ended up doing with my journals is that I um, I scanned through them all. And, and uh, yeah, there's a lot of self-indulgence there. There's nothing I wanted other, what, what, mostly I didn't want other people to read that. Um, I feel like I put out already into the public sphere a lot of my thought and reflection, uh, you know, considered thought, not just rambling. Uh, so, but if yeah. they are journals, they're not necessarily art. They're, they're your own oh, correct. personal. Correct, but the images. Yeah, yeah, the images. Some of the images to me are worthy, and that's why I saved some of them. What I'll do with them, I don't know. But well, the, it's interesting because I was going to bring this up later, but I'll bring it up now. Have you ever heard of a poet named Jessica Powers? No. So anyway, this is here's a book here: the Selected Poems of Jessica Powers, and. Uh, mm -hmm. She was. She later became a nun later in life. She was born in the early 20th century when she was about 31 or so. She joined the, the Carmelite nuns in Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. And she's yeah. a, a pretty good poet. She's not a great poet. She might have become a great poet had she not had so much of her life devoted to God. And then here's a book that was written about her life uh, called Winter Music. Oh. Um, and huh. it's interesting because... Uh, he, this basically tells her own story and it's got you know photos of her joining uh -huh. the, the, the cloister and before and after but it's interesting because there are poems in here that are not in her selected uh, poetry book and yet some of the poems in here that she considered juvenilia uh, <laughs> are actually some of her better poems and even if you look at someone more famous like Sylvia Plath some of her juvenilia is better than a lot of most of the poetry that's published today so um, when you were doing that with your journals, were you satisfied that they were non-art? I mean, uh, whereas 
if if there had been art, if there had if you had been a poet, or if you, if you had had old photographs that you had taken uh, taped in there, would that have made a difference uh, if it had more artistic content? Well, I didn't say that. I did not say that anything that had no artistic content. I've been a critic for years. I was um, an art critic, and I would review other people's art. Um, yeah, I. I, I was pretty discerning, and I didn't. I didn't keep a lot. Mm -hmm. I just I was quite discerning about what I thought was worthy. What I, and what will I do with this stuff? Maybe eventually I'll put it in the shredding box. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I um, the other thing I've done in these years of my life, in the last decade or more than that, actually since twenty thousand uh, two thousand six, when I be, uh, became a hospice volunteer, I had something like 80 hours of training in a couple different venues about working with death and dying. And that, that really has informed everything I've done since then. Um, the awareness of, the, of our mortality and um, yeah, anyway. So uh, do you look at uh, religion then more as a verb? Is religion uh, in a sense or uh, is that your way to communicate with something deeper, whether you want to call it God, nature, uh, you know, or some other uh, yeah. terminology? Yeah, I don't use those words, but yeah, I would say it's a verb, like art. Uh -huh. I mean, I um, I began to explore Buddhist uh, ideas, especially Buddhist iconography. In fact, if anything, that was my entry into curiosity about uh, Buddhism. Um, yeah, I, yeah, mm. so much to say about that. Well, what what is the attraction to Buddhism? I've did, done a couple of shows on it. I know th there's the cliche with uh, a lot of uh, white Western artists either to jazz music and Buddhism as a, a faith based thing, and it, it, it's almost become a cliche, uh, good, bad, or indifferent. What though? Uh, what does uh, the Buddhist philosophy have? that uh, the Abrahamic religions do not? Well, it, there's no God. I mean, I've never believed in God, if, you, if I could put it that starkly. Um, I, you know, I, I would have described myself um, in my, especially in my teen years, as an atheist. In fact, I still have a vivid memory, memory of my friend Janice in eighth grade math class, standing up and shouting at her across the room. She was a very strong Christian in her background. I am an atheist. I don't believe in God. And then I sat down. Um, and in, in later years, I realized a more appropriate word is agnostic. I appreciate that you use that word. Um, well, they, they do I, mean I'll, separate things, to be without God, and one is to have not no knowledge of. So there's a slight difference. I, I completely understand. And that you use both of those words. So mm -hmm. when you said something about yourself so um and i would and i i studied with an incredible mennonite theologian named gordon kaufman um and i i did drawings for his last major publication about his the uh, his kind of worldview um and he he called god what he called god a mennonite he was a very progressive mennonite was the kind of underlying creativity of all things in the universe. And that was an extremely powerful thing for me to, to get out of the idea of the male God. Mm -hmm. um, I studied with, I, I studied Mary Daly's work. She was an arch lesbian separatist at Boston College before she died. And she said, when God is male, the male is God. And she, completely rejected that and wrote series m many books god yeah anyway the problem of god <laughs> so i I've, I've thought about it a lot and i've studied i've studied studied christian theology and uh, studied that more than um, jewish theology but i've i've been close very close friends with a rabbi and i've you know i've studied judaism and i've studied some about islam I've been very interested in Islamic calligraphy. I mean, I think it's one of the most precious forms of religious writing that we have in the human 
in human experience. Um, and writing, uh, I think writing is an incredible, I've done many, many drawings with, uh, with writing, writing over and over and over. Uh, large, you know, five by six, pay, uh, I did prayers once, uh, over and over uh, on this five foot by six foot piece of paper. Um, so anyway, language and writing are really important to me too. Well, if you just look at the uh, biblical uh, symbolism, you know, the breath of God into the clay, um, you know, the word of God, uh, you know, it, 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 we're not seeing the images of God in, in a picture book where we're reading the supposed words of, of a God, yeah. whether you want to call it God as God, God. Yeah. Well, you, you asked me the question, or it, it was implied, why was I drawn to Buddhism? Well, actually, I, in, 19, in the 1970s, I left graduate school and I went out to New York, um, to Long Island, William Irwin Thompson had founded an institute there called the Lindisfarne Association, named after the, the um, well, medieval, well, early 9th century, 8th century Lindisfarne Island in off of Scotland. Was that which, the thing mentioned in, in my dinner with Andre? The, the, on, on yes, the, it was. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it was a place during those years where... Um, scribes and other Christians who were under persecution um, lived. They created the Lindisfarne Gospels, for one thing, there at the British Museum. Um, and it was a hideout, basically. It, it preserved the, the wealth of Christianity. Hmm. Yeah, any, <laughs> that was a little sidebar. So um, let me just talk a little bit about uh, uh, one of the things that draws a lot of people to art, even if they don't have the talent, is they want to feel something that brings them outside of their own experience. Uh, that, uh, to put it in a, a very physical way, is, is almost orgasmic uh, to the mind. Um, you have that with religion. People who have near-death experiences or people that see the Virgin Mary, other people will see UFOs or they'll see, you know, a Bigfoot or they'll see some strange creature, you know, and they'll have that experience of uh, getting outside themselves. Whether whether this is a projection of their own mind or not isn't necessarily relevant. Uh, do, you, do you see then that art and religion in some ways are the same experience expressed or, or, or looked upon from a different vantage point uh, hmm. by society. You know, they're the same thing, but just parallaxed. Oh, ex except for the fact that religions have doctrine. Okay. Every every world religion has doctrine. Well, art has a lot of isms, you know. Yeah, I know, but it, yeah, the human aspiration to create something outside of themselves is is just as long as there have been humans on this earth. Um, you know, like I mentioned, the rock art in Northern Africa or the, that there's a, a just a, a little stone that came out of a cave in Southern Africa. And of course we all know about Lascaux and all of that, but um, well, yeah, the human aspiration. Go Tepe, the Tepe, the, the, the complex of buildings in, in Turkey that might've been the first temple or the first place of worship. Oh, interesting. Yeah, I don't know that one, but I okay. do know about Sardis. Okay. Um, and one of the one of the reasons we know something about some of those ancient sites is is not because anything's written, mm -hmm. but it's because of some writing on stone. Mm -hmm. There were uh, there were a series of large sculptures in uh, it might have been Sardis because that is the one I, place I know the best, where the stones were all knocked over by some invading group. Mm -hmm. And um, when in more recent centuries, as those were able to be stood up, they were able to see the names of people on those stones. Mm -hmm. And that's, and I, I once went to Samothraki in order to see the site of the winged victory. Interestingly, Boise, Idaho, where I lived for a while, has a, a facsimile of the winged victory in its capital building that was given by the city of Paris. And my French pronunciation is terrible, but anyway, Boise was somehow a sister city with Paris. I don't know how that ever happened. 
But anyway, to go to the site where where she was found, and um, th where excavations are still underway, and there's still interest in what the rituals were that were around, that were done there, the ecstatic rituals, drugs, you know, who knows what all was used there. Um, but those artifacts, anyway, they're they're so important. Deborah, um, I want to go back to uh, that quote that I had made earlier about that you had in the beginning again about uh, it doesn't matter what you read. Um, I wanted to talk about the idea of bad art because <laughs> I'm when I see bad art and I think I think I, I'm not one of these people that thinks that everything is subjective or whatnot. That you know you only have to look at for example the famed art restorations where they took a was it Jesus and made him look like a monkey or something? That's bad art. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, to me, bad art has negative consequences on the psyche. Uh, not only the artist, uh, but uh, the people who, who, who view it, uh, they're going to be more cynical. Uh, uh, they're going to, it's going to ruin at, at least maybe their evening uh, if, they're, if they've gone out to an exhibit or gone out and heard some bad music being played by a quartet or, or, or something. Um, and I'm just wondering, um, what, do you, what do you think of, uh, about that? Because that's something that when people talk about art, they rarely talk about. And is there also something then equivalent uh, to bad religion? Can religion be portrayed badly if we look at you know, if, if we maybe, if we don't look at religion as the way art is, the, the, the communication of the thing, um, th th does any of that ring a bell with you or anything? Yeah, well, I haven't, I haven't thought about that question. Um, um, I mean, as a critic, as an art critic, of course, I had to say, make some judgments. This is really effective. This is good, whatever, in a certain context, whatever. Um, whatever that meant, good. Um, I, I actually didn't use. I didn't get into good and bad, but when you said what you when you were talking about that just now, what I thought of were things like the Crusades and Genghis Khan and the destruction of Novgorod by the Mongols. Uh, Mongols, I should say, and um, Novgorod was the site of the most precious. Um, well, actually, Novgorod was one of the few places that escaped most of the destruction because they were surrounded by swamps. Baghdad was ravaged by the Mongols. I know, yeah. I know. Yeah. So, so human activity, I bad. It's, I don't use that word much in my life, actually. Yeah. Um, but human activity can be violent and destructive and um, subver subversive of anything. Uh, anything good, um, but art, yeah, yeah. I I see bad art. I mean, I live in a somewhat small, somewhat small town, a place that's growing leaps and bounds with construction in every corner. Um, and there's a lot of stuff that I look at that I don't have any. I don't know. The I have I have my own view, but I don't make public judgments. I don't write art criticism anymore. Nobody ever asks me to review what's at our local art galleries. Well, I don't I think, want to. I I think though it, it serves a purpose uh, and, a, and a good purpose. Yes, you can have a bad critics too. Uh, um, uh, criticism of art I think serves an important purpose, and you can have bad critics and good critics as well. Just because an, an opinion is negative doesn't mean it's not a good opinion. It could be a good opinion. You know, if you if you if you're saying something that is really shoddy art is is somehow great, you're a bad critic. But yeah. um uh, But I don't I, I I don't want to spend my time looking at work about which I will say this is not worthy. I, I really have never done that. Right. I've I've never written a review which says this is bad art. I've certainly seen a lot of bad art, but I also had choices during the few years that I was active every week as a critic. Um, I I had choices, and I I just where do I want to give my time and energy? Life is precious, you know. So, I um, I don't worry too much about those judgments. 
bad and good. In it's that, out there. Every, I mean, human, the human wish to create and people are not experienced. Um, it's, it's the, it's all, it's not all good. I'm not thinking that's, um, it's, it's all part of human aspiration. Um, the idea though, of getting behind someone else's eyes that you have, that was in that quote, um, uh, does that, does that also apply to religion too? Because oftentimes we think of, uh, religious belief systems being one of the major dividers of human yeah. beings. Um, yeah. and it seems yeah. that religion almost dictates to not get, uh, behind the eyes of another person. For example, I always say when I'm writing a character, I don't care what their eyes, the color is, it's what those eyes are seeing in the tale and, mm -hmm. and me focusing on the important things to, to, to say why you should be knowing about this particular character in this particular situation. Um, do, you, do you think that that lack of empathy, that lack of getting behind another's eyes is something that's endemic or in a negative sense in religions, plural? Probably. I mean, almost mo most religions have the um, those who judge others. You know, there's um, yeah, I've met people like that. I mean, uh, they're not people I want to spend time with. Anybody, yeah, I. I Fundamentalists of any any religious variety, uh, they all they all exist. Um, um, what? Well, just to come back to something you were asking me earlier, the one one thing that I, initially when I went back to graduate school at Harvard, I was interested in studying Sanskrit and Hindu philosophy. Um, I'd been a yoga teacher and I'd been studying yoga philosophy, samkhya and yoga, and I I thought that's what I would do went back there. But I met the theologian, Gordon Kaufman, and I also took some other classes in art history and um, with one with the one of the excavators from Sardis. Um, and I, I realized that I didn't really want to study and also took cl classes. I helped teach a world religions class, which was eye opening for me because I as a as a self declared declared atheist in my youth and as somebody who became more agnostic in my early adulthood, I was fascinated. I, I didn't know. I didn't know the difference between a Protestant and a, and a Catholic mm -hmm. when I was 35 years old, which is, in retrospect, it's like I had no religious education, no, no Christian education. Um, but anyway, I, that, that's um, I, I had a lot to learn and anyway, I, I decided not to settle down in Hindu studies and go study Sanskrit, which is, as you probably know, that's it's a massive undertaking. It's a very complex language. Mm -hmm. And um, instead, I, I studied all kinds of other things. Um, so instead of just getting behind someone else's eyes, uh, I, when I saw that quote, I was also thinking of uh, Emerson's nature essay and you know that I became a transparent eyeball thing uh, you know something yeah. that 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 lifts yourself up above almost like uh, if you ever read that book Flatland where uh, a square is knocked up above Flatland by the sphere and can look down and see things that you know no other uh, square had ever seen before um, do, do you think that religion and art can do that when they're at their best which or which does it better uh, do you think Hmm, that's a really great question. I, I guess I think there are always limitations in, in religious ideology. Unless, I mean, a person has to be an unusual practitioner of a religion to be as open as some artists are. I was just thinking of Mark Rothko just then. Um, I'm sure, I don't know where you live, but uh, visiting his, the chapel, the Rothko Chapel in Houston, was really quite wonderful for me. All the black paintings. Um, I had studied Rothko. I, I loved his art from very 
as, as I learned about art um, and his whole sense, the tragic sense of life that, that he brought into his painting. And um, I, I've all, I guess I've always, it, I've always felt the arts and, and inclusive of dance and music and I mean, my goodness, music. Huh. Well, I'm not, I'm not that knowledgeable about all kinds of jazz or classical music. I knew the best probably because I played an instrument in a symphony and chamber groups and stuff. But um, film, the other visual arts, um, poetry, um, novels, fiction, nonfiction. I mean, it's. I think it's more power in in a sense. There's a kind of more openness there than in religious ideologies, and p individuals have particular views, obviously. Whether as artists, um, I don't make Buddhist art, but it, I'm sure it, my what I make is informed by my sensibilities, my meditation. Um, you know, whatever. So. Uh, where do you think that the the genesis of religious belief that people have comes from? Uh, is it a similar place uh, as art? Because for me, I've always I've always get uh, a little antsy when I hear people talking about uh, the idea that God chose them to do this or that. For me, my art comes from me. I think I have this idea I call the divine inspiration fallacy as to why. Uh, many artists are angry and jealous and petty with other artists uh, because they feel that if you took something down from the cosmos creatively, there's less up there for them to take. Um, but I also see that uh, um, that in religion, there's also that sense that there's that higher place it, to get to where that transparent eyeball of Emerson might be. Um, do you be, do you believe, for example, uh, you said you don't believe in God? Uh, is, is there something, though, in that deeper sense uh, of the spirit cosmic or whatever you want to call it, uh, that does it emanate from the individual always? Uh, you know, because like Emily Dickens said, the, the mind is greater than the universe because the mind can contain the universe kind of thing. Um, w in what order do you put those things? Dickinsonian, uh, biblical, what? <laughs> Hmm. Did you like to ask that question with a little more simplicity, <laughs> or a little more directness? You 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 brought in a lot of different elements just there. I just my mind just went off in quite a few. Well, how, how 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 do you get to that that place of transcendence? Then um, is it uh, is it uh, you know a, a, a more one two three progression? Uh, is it that all, all of a sudden bang something turns on and and you're in a new realm? Transcendent position. Well, I make no claims about my capacity for... Uh, um, what, what I think of is something like joy. What, what, what brings joy? How do, we, how do we cultivate equanimity and even joy in this lifetime? I mean, as far as we we don't know whether we have one lifetime to live out or whether there are more but i will say that when i was pretty young and maybe you know the the genesis of this i i subscribed for a while to a, a newsletter called mind m i n d mm. i don't i haven't looked it up i i'm curious where it came from but it was the first time i ever wasn't hindu it wasn't buddhist I don't, I don't know its origins. I could investigate, but it was the first time I ever heard the idea that consciousness survives death. Uh -huh. that it trans that it it enters another another sphere, and maybe we there's um, actually I'd say one more thing about that. Um, in high school, I read Archie and Mahitable. Did you ever read that? Don Marquis. He was a oh yeah yeah the 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 cartoon. Yeah, Archie. He, uh, he he wrote a series of um, 
uh, not articles, but he had a column in the Chicago Chicago Tribune, and he published a book of all these dialogues of Archie and Mahitable, a, a cat and a cockroach. Yeah, it, and it, it, it reminded me of Crazy Cat and Ignat's Mouse. Yeah, right. But that's the that's another place where I heard the word reincarnation mm -hmm. as a, a teenager. I thought, what the hell is that? Um, it's not going to heaven, at, at least not in um, Archie and Mahitable. Mm. And not in that magazine called Mind, yeah. um, and it, it 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 was it was curious. I I thought about it a lot. We don't. Uh, that's the agnostic part of me. Mm -hmm. Even as a practicing um, Buddhist meditator, I I don't. I'm, I'm agnostic. I don't know if there's what rebirth. Um, there's a beautiful book recently written in the last year called uh, Rebirth by Roger Jackson. Mm -hmm. I don't know what happens at the end of life. I've been with people at the end of life um, as a as a hospice volunteer and a, as a friend. Um, but I, I kind of have that feeling of I'm interested to find out. Um, so, but you know, who knows? Um, you had mentioned uh, when you started on this tangent uh, about a joy and uh, ecstasy. One of the things I think- Oh, like, uh, joy and equanimity. Equanimity. Uh, one of the things though, I think that's often missed uh, in the, just the human condition, uh, people often focus on happiness. Uh, I, I find it, uh, yeah. when, I, when I hear, for example, parents say, all I want for is my child to be happy. I'm like, boy, you have low expectations. I mean, mm -hmm. maybe, maybe, you know, your kid could, uh, be of great service to others. Uh, maybe there's actual positive stuff that comes from melancholy. It wasn't all, it was only 50 years or so ago in the mid 20th century, century that people said, you know, being depressed is not something you should be taking pills for. You can, you know, if you think of all of the, the great philosophical arguments and even, even great artistic works, they often come from places of pain and, and, and despair. And, and, and these are things that, that may not be good when they are, uh, are being felt, but if that if that gets you uh, Moby Dick, if that gets you uh, you know uh, Don Quixote, it's yeah. worth it. And uh, it, there seems to be to me this commoditization now that all religion, and I think th this goes from the obvious con artists of, of like the televangelists to even more mainstream churches uh, that that. Uh, we should only seek out God for love and happiness as if those are the only positive things in the universe. Um, what is your take on this idea, say, of melancholy or the non-ecstatic? Yeah, I really appreciate what you were just saying. Um, I, I, I appreciated in one of your interviews hearing a, a wee bit I don't, about your own life. Mm. And my early life had a lot of suffering. Um, and uh, obviously my family of origin um, was a family of tremendous suffering. And uh, when I say that, I, that's the obvious thing. I mean, how else does one know? So when I was 16, in a wonderful health class in high school, our teacher asked us each to our, say something about what we wanted in this life. And I, I said at that time, geez, criminy, just to be happy. I, in, you know, instead of witnessing so much suffering all the time and feeling the inner trauma of that, the kind of the resonance of um, of that, but but that that really changed as I grew into adulthood. You know, I but I I, I appreciate what you were saying about happiness because it's not the be all and end all. I mean, in the use. I'm thinking of Rothko again. He's a good example of someone who carried around his through his life the tragic sense of human existence, and made art out of that, and made beautiful, beautiful art also, which is degrading because he used house paint. It's like Ro uh, Pollock, whose whose dances I never really savored. I mean, dancing around the canvas. I what the hell. I don't care. It's kind of, but but Rothko is a different case. I mean, you, some people would just put them all in the same abstract expressionist 
boat, but I don't see them as anywhere near each other. Yeah, um, I, the reason I bring this up, uh, up uh, in the, uh, about six, seven months ago, I finished uh, this novel uh, called Center of Mass, which I was going, I wanted to always write a book about World War II. Um, uh, I know, though, having grown up, uh, I was born in 65, my dad was born in 1916, uh, he was 4F uh, for World War II, but uh, he wanted to, to serve, he couldn't serve, uh, and his buddies that served, there wasn't this triumphalism that decades mm -hmm. later got amplified, you know, when Tom Brokaw did that Greatest Generation thing. All of these people were talking mostly about the people that they lost and they suffered. Uh, I had a job 17 years ago where uh, I, I basically ha was trying to sell books of uh, information uh, for certain groups, uh, including the military. And, uh, you know, I would talk to people and we'd, I'd hear their stories as I'm trying to sell them the books. And as I, I got to do the, the right to do the book, I was like, do I really want to do another Naked and the Dead or Thin Red Line? And I, I thought, no, let me talk about the kinds of people that actually lived through that time and how the war, not the war itself, but how the, the past the war reverberated through them good, bad, or indifferent. And so it deals with some PTSD, but also the way that people move on and they carry their pains with them. And that's just the way life is. Um, and I think I think a lot of times we get people like a Brokaw with his book, and I don't think he intended it to, who have this almost evangelical zeal within their, their non-religious beliefs about the greatest generation. They beat, beat the Nazis, they did that. But they didn't. They didn't do damn shit about uh, Jim Crow. They didn't do damn shit about uh, uh, women's rights, gay rights, uh, uh, black civil rights, and, and all this stuff. Um, and so, um, do you think that there is inherently within religion this need for triumphalism that may be absent in art? Yeah, perhaps. And but the world's religions are diverse, and and they all have. Is it more of a Western thing then? Maybe, yeah, maybe. Although think of the religious wars in India and yeah. Tamil culture and Sri Lanka. I mean, and the the old Burma, Myanmar. And there's a lot of, there are wars that have some religious dimensions all over the world. Mm -hmm. um, and, but yeah. I mean, and, because India was a hotbed of that too. Even though Buddhism and and Hinduism started, there. have you ever heard of the Oxus culture? O X U S. It, o X. No, I haven't. It, it's a civilization that they've found going back, I think, four thousand, five thousand years, somewhere between the Caspian Sea and below what's the remains now of the Aral Sea, um, and uh, it's a culture that seemingly was wiped out, and they believe that uh, ancient. Indus people from the you know Indus Valley came and and wiped them out. Um, so even in that area, uh, one of the earliest civilizations, you go back four or five thousand years. There's still this triumphalism that my you know us Indus people are better than you Oxus people. Yeah, yeah, I that's that's interesting, and that's still going on, isn't it, right now? In the same in part of the world. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. yeah. I. Uh, Human violence has no end. I mean, kind of, yeah. I, 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 I wrote this book called The Vocation of the Artist, which was an academic book published by Cambridge University Press. But it's that book started with a little article I wrote uh, for a, a magazine called Meaning. And and it's where I first said the vocation of the artist is the reclamation of the future, which I, you know, I, as I lived into adulthood through Vietnam and all of all of that, um, all, all of the subsequent destruction, and uh, I felt like there, you know, the creativity of artists of all kinds is like the most uplifted aspect of all human experience. Um, and not that art, not it, not that it's going to save the world. I didn't, but to, to believe that the, there could be a future.
there could that a future could exist that's different than the present so full of meanness and greed well still full the world the world is so full of meanness and greed and it's not going to go away we we're probably self-destructive as, as a species yeah it just I don't hold a lot of hope about that right now but hope is also you know it's this very sustaining and um how we find hope in our daily lives and I think through through creativity and sharing creativity and what you were just describing about the um the book that you wrote most recently this you know there's a kind of hope that comes through that I mean, even even if it's not a topic that is hopeful or you know trying to show the light at the end of the tunnel or something like that it's a very bad cliche but hmm. do you think uh, that there's the idea in art of the demiurge that which uh, the artistic uh, impulse creativity flows through um, is there a similar thing that you can find in most religions that uh, uh, I mean you have the idea of prophets you know Muhammad or or John, was it John Smith uh, with the, the Mormons um, uh, is that is is that something uh, that there is a, a a connection with art and religion, or is is the idea of uh, you know a, a Vatic uh, prophet uh, sort of being is that more exclusively religious? Do you think? Well, I uh, that's an interesting question. I I think art can be prophetic. Um, I don't have any claims to make anything that's prophetic myself. Um, it, what, what does prophetic mean, though? I mean, maybe it leads toward hope. Um, maybe it, it, it's a way to, or, or compassion. Um, so, mm, it's, well, I, it's complex question you're asking. Someone like Walt Whitman is often considered a, a Vatic a poet, a, a prophetic poet. He's someone with a vision. Uh, the difference is an artist is, will cast their vision on a canvas, uh, in a 500-page book, or in a symphony, perhaps, that, that will lift you up for 40 minutes or whatnot. But the religious uh, prophet is trying to impose that into the real world where others exist. Um, mm -hmm. You always have the, the the ability to turn the switch on and off of how you're going to react to art. But if someone comes marching in with their troops and they're saying that, oh, now you're going to believe A, B, and C, uh, you know that's that's a bit more intrusive. Uh, yeah, I, I I totally agree. I think art in this in that sense um, is is a more I don't know. Now the word pristine comes to mind, but. Uh, uh, yeah, we our our whole human history is full of of the first part that first part of what you're talking about. You know the the marching in of people who destroy what's present. Um, poof, still happening all over. I've got. Sorry. I can't even read my own bad handwriting. In two thousand and nine, what was the book you wrote? It was called a book of this place. Was it? Yeah. Book. Uh, yeah. Book of this place. I had okay. spent ten years working on a site in Jamestown, Colorado, uh, right on a river, uh, building a garden, doing stone carving, gathering. I had a couple, maybe a ton of stone for several projects. And um, and in 2013 there was a flood. And um, it, it, that. But anyway, I published that book before before after ten years of working on the site and let's call it a pan maybe to place mm -hmm. power of place and um and i actually had a fantasy that i would be there for my whole life and that i would be the old lady who's lives on the river and and carves marble and you have to be careful and don't get in her dust and on and on but that was all gone in 2013 mm -hmm. and um and a huge that I won't go into all the personal details in this, but it, it was a major transformation of 
my aspirations in my life in every way. Because you and, you wrote, from what I got from uh, online, you said, uh, I believe that the artist is a self-critically engaged agent in particular situations calling for the reclamation of the sacred of the future in a world that seems in many ways to be dying. Uh, to yeah. me, the two most important words, a single word hyphenate would be, or two words, I guess, self-critically engaged. That is often an idea that seems utterly missing in most religions. Um, uh, there doesn't seem to be uh, an analysis of the self. Uh, it, it's only what can come into my life, what uh, by giving up part of myself, I'm going to get some nebulous thing back. Uh, whereas with art, it seems to me there needs to be that self-critical engagement, as you mentioned here. Um, is that a correct reading by me of what yeah. you're stating? I appreciate the way you said that. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I mean, that's a pretty highfalutin view statement. Mm -hmm. uh, well, you can hide your falute. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right. yeah. Yeah, I, I, uh, I, yeah, I've, I've written a lot of a lot of sentences that sometimes I look at and say, where was I when I wrote that? When I that language came together, I love language, as you do. You know, the play of language is just. But I, I'm, I mean, I played around with writing poetry, but pff, I'm not a poet. I, I think I, I like to untangle ideas in a more call it linear and um, yeah but I, I I was in a relationship with a poet for a number of years and um, that was fascinating to you know work see his work in progress and um, and in in final publication too so it's well, if you, if you want to, something, just to toot my own horn, if you go onto my other sister uh, YouTube channel called E Cosmoetica, I have a hundred minute video where I wrote a sonnet within that hundred minutes in real time. And it's, it's something that I don't think anyone's ever done. Uh, I mean, yes, there's the dance, as you call it, of Pollock dancing around, but I think writing a sonnet is a bit more engaging myself. But um, uh, you could just a Dan Schneider writes a sonnet. Google that in, and, and it'll come up if if you have. Yeah, I think I else. think when I was looking at your um, the various websites, I think I I saw that. I didn't take mm -hmm. the time to spend a hundred minutes with no. it. Um, so um, I wanted to talk uh, also since you mentioned the self critical engagement. Um, uh, yesterday, uh, while I was going through notes, financial stuff. Uh, uh, I sometimes have YouTube playing on in the background and as the queue comes up, uh, I saw, and I don't know if, if you are familiar with it, back in the 1960s, there was this claymation cartoon called Davy and Goliath. It was put out by the Lutheran but Church. But I knew about clay, uh, claymation because I was in a class with a professor with some students who were doing claymation. Yeah. Uh, but well, I don't know that one. Yeah, the, the fellow who did Gumby Art Cloakey was his name. You, you know the character of Gumby? No. No? Okay. Well, there's anyway. A lot that, of, there's a lot of contemporary culture that I didn't pay attention to, I think. Okay. Well, uh, basically this Davy and Goliath is about a boy named Davy and his dog named Goliath. And from in the 1960s through the 1970s, they did about 60, 15 to 30 minute cartoons. where, And it was produced by the Lutheran Church of America. Um, uh, oh. And basically these claymation characters would deal with all sorts of issues, uh, 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 usually ending in a moral where Davy might have told a lie and he gets caught, or uh, someone uh, uh, gets into a fight because there's a bully. Uh, it was one of the few uh, outlets you could find in the 1960s that showed Asian and black and white people living together in sort of a utopian kind of, if not, situation. But as close as you could imagine in the 1960s, um, and I, a couple of the 15 little minute cartoons came on, and I hadn't seen them for, you know, how many decades I don't recall. Um, but they were very didactic. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. I mean, the claymation itself was quite a, a feat for the time. But you know, you you generally knew a few minutes in what was going to happen. Uh, mm -hmm. That Davy was going to get 
told that, you know, God loves us all and you have to keep that, you broke your leg, baby, now you have to wear your cast so God can heal your leg, that kind of thing. Um, but it, even as a kid and, and even watching it, uh, despite some of the obvious stuff, it was also a very effective uh, little way to deliver a parable. Uh, certainly more effective, I thought, than a lot of the Bible stories that I would uh, read in Sunday school when I was a child. Um, where do you, uh, what place, if any, do you look for didacticism in art and religion? Because both of them uh, can, can fall into it. Religion, maybe a little bit more so. But uh, is didacticism necessarily a bad thing, do you think? Well, every teacher, and I've been a teacher in my, I always said I, I taught something to someone for 50 years, and I'm not teaching anything to anybody anymore. I've been asked to teach some classes, and I've just said, well, oh, I'm done with that. Um, I, I, I guess I'd say that I, didacticism has, has a place. I mean, just thinking back, you know, it takes many forms. I was, I was a very strict teacher in certain circumstances. Um, and some people may have, if they knew that word didactic, they might have said, oh God, Professor Haynes is too didactic. You know? mm -hmm. But, um, which meant I'm, there, there, were, there were lines that uh, they shouldn't cross or, you know, participation, was uh, mandatory or I don't know. You couldn't just sit back in your chair and especially in one of my small classes, forget it, you, could, you know what, leave. I, I had more than once said to somebody, you don't have to be here, you can go. Uh, if you, you know. Then anyway, didacticism has many, many kinds, but um, yeah. I, it's not a it's not a uh, mode or a stance that I relished or want to take or even want to investigate others' didacticism. I'm, I'm just I'm not interested in it. How about uh, utility in uh, religion, especially because obviously art can serve a utilitarian purpose uh, often because you know someone will commission a work of art. They'll commission a portrait of themselves. They'll commission uh, uh, an opera. They'll commission this, that, or the other thing that is maybe to serve a generic public purpose, uh, maybe for an art festival or something. Um, uh, do you think that uh, religion uh, has a utile side? And if so, is that something that is underutilized uh, in modern society in, in, in terms of talking about religion? You know, that mm. you, you, the utility of how it serves society possibly in a positive way. Yeah. Well, how does it serve society in a positive way? I, I guess that would be the... Um, mm, I, I, uh, my thought flies over to fundamentalisms. And uh, when which has always kind of, well, I'm, offended me in some way. Um, I, 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 I think it's, there's more destruction um, that comes out of fundamentalist thinking than... Well, but, but I, it's not necessarily a fundamentalist. For example, a, a friend of mine died last year. He was a mentally ill man who had one point been homeless, he had a traumatic brain injury, he had several addictions, and he spent the last 40 years of his life uh, as, a, as a Methodist. He was in a, what would be considered, I guess, a, a, a left-leaning uh, Methodist church. He, he went on missions to Haiti, uh, to other, you know, not, not to convert, but just to do help. So, I mean, yes. people, when they hear the born again, I mean, he, he described himself as a born again Christian, but not in the Jerry Falwell sense. Yeah, yeah, that's really a that's a wonderful example, um, but that there's no didacticism there. Mm -hmm. uh, there's, but the utility aspect, he he served a, a function, uh, yes, uh, yes. positively. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
there's a there's a lot of art that it would that doesn't have utility I, I, art i mean um <laughs> that we have all these classifications high art low art um artless art um yeah, utility is an interesting question that I I don't feel hmm, so articulate about at the moment. The, there's a term that's come uh, into usage the last half decade, or maybe even the last decade, uh, called intersectionality uh, within uh, academia. Uh, and, uh, you know, this is sort of, I guess maybe the the academic equivalent of the idea of the butterfly effect that everything is interconnected um and uh i i know because i uh, in, in looking over some of the stuff that you had online that you have uh used that term about interconnectedness more than once uh yes. do, you, do you think that religion forces interconnectedness or is it a disconnector it's it i'd say it's both i mean it, not not one particular religious community probably doesn't move in both directions, but um, the inter it's the profound interconnectedness of all things is and all events uh, to me it's it's a ground of my own worldview that there is there is no se separation um, and it's a myth. Uh, might be personal, it could be a cultural myth that we can somehow um, act in a kind of independent way, Some do, do something that's not uh, going to have repercussions and effects in, in multiple channels that we may or may not see. So I, yeah, it's, a, it's I would say, um, that for me that is the meaning of the buddhist concept of emptiness mm. that nothing has intrinsic existence by itself everything is interconnected everything has consequences whether it's art or religious beliefs or practices um everything ripples has consequences in personal and public life and what happens in the public arena, obviously, is interconnected. You know what? Um, do you think, uh, if we're talking about interconnectedness, does that bring up the idea of teleology, that there's a purpose uh, to these things? Um, obviously, an artist is going to have a pur purpose if they want to uh, write about this or that or, or do a song about this or that. Um, but religion... Uh, do you think religion is tele teleologically driven? Um, yeah. Some, I was, as you said is that, that a word, good or bad I was thinking, thing? yeah, I was thinking of Teilhard de Chardin. You know, his he had very strong teleology about the world and um, Christi, his Christian faith. And um, now I, yeah, I don't. Certainly, everything we do has consequences. But in, in the bigger picture, well, yeah, I go, I, I friend, I, I haven't been watching uh, Amy Goodman lately, but uh, one of my friends just told me about a talk she heard a couple days ago about climate change from one of the people who sees that uh, it was articulating the irreversibility of all the changes, the oceans, the air, all of it, and in a way that um, made her cry. I mean, it was, it's pretty, it, it, you know, the death of the seas and um, the coral reefs and all of that. So if there's a teleology, and, and also, one of the things that always interested me within Hindu uh, thought was the idea of the yugas that that human and all life cycles through these various um, yugas uh, worlds world periods mm. and that death and destruction and complete renewal are also that happens who know I don't know if I believe that but I think it's a we're witnessing um, 
levels of destruction, who knows what the consequences will be, even in our lifetimes. It's um, pretty dramatic. Um, yeah, well, I mean, that's one of those things that, uh, uh, and, and most people are, are oblivious to it. Uh, you know, I, I recently read something that in the last 10 years, uh, that since was the Paris Protocols, uh, we're dumping more carbon dioxide than ever before. So it's like, I mean, you know, it, it, well, it, it's, it's one of those things that is its own show. Um, uh, let me let me talk about a couple of other things here, and then we can sort of wrap up. Um, one of the things that I've often said that when an artist wants to express something is they, they need to learn the value of forgetting things. Uh, um, I mentioned the, the, the book that I did about World War II or the aftermath of World War II. And um, I, I always try to, when I'm doing something, whether it's writing a poem or a play or a, a book, is to not do the same thing. So I, I, I have the basic principles of art in my mind and writing in my mind, the general pr principles. But the specifics I always let come and go, and I, I, I try to forget it so that I come with as clean a palette as if I'm starting for the first time. Um, I think one of the failures that happens with most art is uh, people get some sense of success, whether it's just the artistic success of, of the work itself succeeding, or whether it's the approbation and or remuneration of, uh, from society at large. Um, and they, they almost subconsciously repeat the same uh, yeah. thing. And what worked on the first or second iteration on the 17th or 23rd iteration isn't going to work as well. Yet, that seems to be the opposite as re of religion. A religion seems to, to, to thrive on repetition, whether it's in, in the hymnals, whether it's in uh, stating the same parables over and again in that didactic sense. Um, what is, is your take on uh, the power of, of being able to start anew to forget uh, and is that, do you think that that's something, if you agree that that might be a good thing in art, do you think that is something that religion could somehow co-opt? Mm. Well, I, I, I'm struck by the, not dichotomy necessarily, but the um, continuum of forgetting and remembering that, um, I mean, in the creative process, obviously there's both. Um, and the utility of both forgetting what one may be set out to do or remembering. Um, uh, seems like the human imagination, uh, human beings have a very good forgettery. You know, they, they don't, we as a species don't do a very good job of remembering the lessons we should have learned or could have learned, might learn, probably can uh, just the example you gave, um, uh, and we were just talking about the world, um, the, um, you know, we're in an irreversible process right now, and within in our physical world, and there's a lot of forgetting going on, <laughs> as you mentioned the Paris Accords, you know, um, uh, oof, it's very complex. Seems like there's a place for both. In the creative process, and especially for the artist in his or her own <clears throat> process, and, um, excuse me. Seems like um, forgetting mem memory release spontaneity, release of memory, release of past aspirations or whatever, and, um, you know, following the moment, following the, the stream uh, of the stream of consciousness, or just the stream, what, what seems to be wanting to emerge um, in creative work, with, in whatever form, writing or music, or I was thinking of jazz just when I said that, Tremendous beauty and um, and not just beauty, but pain. All kinds of things can be released in that process. So it seems 
It's in, uh, yeah. So, um, I, in the course of this conversation, I had mentioned, uh, uh, I implied that I think our art exists at a more human level, whereas religion tends to view things through mm -hmm. the supernatural lens. Um, for better or worse, and even though uh, fundamentalism in, in certain religious beliefs uh, bubbles up now and again, it seems that we're on an almost irreversible course toward, towards a more agnostic world, I think, you know, in a couple of hundred years, especially those who are going to go through, if you want to stick with the climate change uh, argument, uh, this is going to be something that's going to be take a world war kind of effort uh, to help uh, uh, adjust to uh, and maybe find technologies that can reverse things. Um, if religion in a hundred or two hundred years is significantly lesser than what it is, if let's say the Catholic Church is at the level of the Mormon Church in terms of influence, um, do you think that that art can step in as a default uh, for the human condition, and I'm not even talking about things like artificial intelligence or not. Those have their own uh, mm -hmm. contingencies and their own the pros and cons. But at, at a human level, do you think art is inevitably going to play a, a larger role in human life, or is is it always sort of destined to be just that little thing on the margins that a, a small handful of people are engaged in? That's a that's a good question. Um, I was just thinking of music when you said that, and um, the the power of music to uplift, but also to uh, um, oh, what is his name? Sorrowful songs. Um, mm, can't remember his name right this second. Um, I think he think might be Lithuanian, Polish, Polish composer. Do you, um, um, uh, anyway, yeah. art is capable of showing tremendous pain, and um, and yet it's also capable of being very uplifting at, at the same time. So I, I don't have an easy answer to to what you're or an easy response, a clear response to what you're saying. But um, yeah. Mm. So uh, just to wrap up. Uh, then, um, uh, do you have any final thoughts that you want to expound uh, that uh, we haven't touched upon? Because uh, um, you know you have written a lot about it. Is there any particular? Well, let, let me ask this: Is there any particular art form that you think is uh, especially more akin to uh, invoking that kind of response that religion gets? That 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 transcendent thing that people who whether they're going you know, getting that laying on of hands or, or something. Uh, do you think film does that better? Do you think that writing does that better? That dance? Uh, or, or, or what? Well, those are all kind of, I mean, all art, most art is ephemeral. Mm -hmm. And what what I thought immediately as you were speaking is um, those Sardis sculptures that I mentioned, stone. Um, people use the phrase it's written in stone well I thought to hell with that stone gets absorbed into the landscape in a bad flood or um, during a bad fire I had carved a stone for a friend and that stone was completely it was a pristine gorgeous marble and um and it was Colorado Yule marble, which is an incredibly beautiful marble. It's um, it's in Lincoln Memorial and other things in D.C. But um, but written in stone, it is not. Um, it's also it's not impervious. Stone is not impervious to change. No. But but um, so much of evanescent and so much art is has that quality of. You know, being present and you know they burn think of all the burnings of libraries that happened in the ancient world and even the digital world did you ever read E.M. Forster's one science fiction story called The Machine Stops I read only a couple of his stuff and no, I didn't even know he wrote uh, sci-fi well 
No, that was the only science fiction mm. story he ever wrote. It describes the world. He wrote it in 1923, mm. which I, I think it was 23. And it's 2023. He's describing the world we live in. Yeah. It, he's described in that story, he, he's describing the world with the screen, where we live so much of our lives through the screen. Mm. And um, it, it's chilling. It's absolutely t chilling because it's called the machine stops. Mm. What happens when we lose electricity, when we lose Wi-Fi? You know, it, it's um, it so much disappears. Our our the the connections we take for granted right now completely disappear. Um, could disappear. Um, I I I think maybe I've always been a bit of an apocalyptic thinker. Um, separate from any you know particular religious view but even my study early on or interest in the notion of hindu yugas these world ages that continue and that there's a complete destructive cycle and then a renewal the machine stops forster's view um was very compelling to me when i read it still many you know a couple decades later it still resonates for me especially in the world we're in right now uh, it's interesting you mentioned the, these yugas and you were also talking about uh, uh, you know language and I, it made me think of uh, there's that sea chamber up on Svalbard island where all they store all the seeds of uh, all the major grains and all the major plants I, in case there's some disaster yeah, yeah. and also yeah. also when there are nuclear waste sites one of the troubles with both of them is how to make signs that say stay away in 10,000 years because in 10,000 years that's very unlikely that anyone listening to this would recognize any words that we're saying. English is going to, if it exists, be what Indo-European is, is now most likely. Um, and so there is that time, there's that, you know, Ozymandias kind of thing where even languages uh, fall away. Uh, uh, and... Uh, but uh, let, let, let me just end it, uh, just bring it back uh, to, to the personal, because you said you don't, you're not uh, going to be teaching anymore. So given your interest in religion and art, um, what are you going to be doing then in the future? Do you, are you writing any book about anything else coming up or what? No, I'm not writing any more books mm -hmm. uh, at the moment. I, I don't think I will in mm -hmm. this lifetime. I might, um, I, I don't know, maybe I'll help somebody else with some writing projects, but I don't have an aspiration to do that. I want to mess around with materials and images and, um, you know, who knows? This is a, a human life is a short operation. And um, I, yeah, I, I, but I, messing around with creativity, um, I, I was, uh, the artist Mary Caroline Richards, who wrote Centering in in the 60s and a number of other books, and I edited and helped publish her last book, which is called Opening Our Moral Eye, um, was once, somebody asked her in an interview, what's your favorite animal? Is there an animal that you think you relate to? And she, she went like this, the inchworm. Mm which is, you know, comes up walking along the end of a piece of grass and then it's going like this, not knowing where, where, where could it possibly go. I kind of relate to that right now. Mm -hmm. I'm not, I, I don't hold huge aspirations or, um, but my creative process continues in unlikely ways. Right now I'm working with materials I've found materials and I'm doing some assemblages that I, what the hell are these? Mm. I call the whole series the mystery series because I couldn't tell you. Mm. Someday I think I'll probably look at this and say, oh, and it's, um, I have no uh, huge aspirations for that. But, but as I told you at the outset, I'm very involved in care of an elder and have been for a long time. And that has, that, that shapes my day-to-day -day life very strongly. Mm. Um, so 
Does the creative process continue? Absolutely. And I'm, I, I'm grateful to have this opportunity to talk with you. You have a wide ranging intellect and I appreciate that. I really do. I was thinking when you were talking about the inchworm that there might be a, a giant cosmic Danny Kaye somewhere singing that song about you, you know, inchworm, inchworm, Deborah, Deborah, where, where are you going? I love it. <laughs> well, I, love I will it. link to a Deborah J. Haynes com, your website. Uh, anyone you. seeing this uh, can look there for more of uh, your books and uh, ideas. So thank you for spending about an hour and a half to speak with me. Thank you, Dan. I, I enjoyed it very much.